a man pinning his sheriff badge to his shirt and preparing his room. What Holston is about to do will change everything. He emerges into the giant base for which numerous people are living. They're inside a great silo, but all the residents are in the dark over what their purpose is and what they're doing here. They don't know when it'll be safe to venture outside either, but one thing's for sure, it's not right now. Sheriff Holston heads into Holding 3 and looks outside the window. He locks the door and throws the keys outside, telling Morris that he really wants to go outside to meet his beloved. For now, he's locked himself up and decides to stay on his bed. As the deputy shows, Holston tells him he wants to venture outside. We then cut back in time to see Holston with his partner, Allison. They're trying for a baby and things are looking good. It's their third and final time of trying, given Allison is 38. She has her birth control implant removed by the doctor, and the pair prepare for what's to come. At dinner, an old woman called Gloria shows up and urges Allison to come to see her. Holston is not happy with this, pointing out that she's a fraud, as Gloria has a reputation for making her subjects do whatever she wants, promising them the world for nothing. This soon subsides as the days pass, and the pair continue to try and get pregnant. Allison actually works as a reporter, but whilst there, she's reprimanded by her boss, Bernard. Allison has been breaking the rules, and she's called out for it. She's been asking questions about the rebels and the before times. They have the pact in place which forbids questions like this. And Sheriff Holston is not happy with the way this conversation is going. After all, it's his job to make sure the doors stay firmly shut so whatever is outside doesn't get in. They've been here a while, so long, in fact, that the outside is starting to get dirty and obscuring the wasteland view. As for Allison, she's confronted by Gloria, who speaks to her in private. She runs the tap to make sure the judicial team can't hear her, as she goes on to point out what's happening outside. She knows that Allison is someone that wonders. Gloria questions whether the authorities actually want her to get pregnant, hinting at some sort of conspiracy theory. Allison and Holston continue to try and get pregnant, even having sex at the work desk. While this simmers away in the background, Allison meets George Wilkins, who happens to be a repair guy. He's printed out a post online and is operating in the shadows to avoid the gaze of the judicial. He's been trying to retrieve an old drive that's over 140 years old. Given they've been told that all of them were destroyed, this throws their entire history and what they've been told into disarray. While the pair work, everyone else celebrates their Freedom Day, with big banners up and all the members of the silo gathered to greet the judicial and cheer. The mayor gives a rousing speech about remembering the terror of the rebellion and how they destroyed everything, including all the books and the computer drives. As she speaks, we cut back to Allison and George, who both find plans for the silo blueprints on this drive. Allison loses her nerve, believing this is a relic and it's forbidden to have it, and tells George that he needs to destroy it. Allison heads back to see Gloria, becoming ever more disillusioned with what's happening inside the silo. In fact, she decides to finally see everything, moving between Gloria and George to understand what may be hidden from them. The final file with the latter happens to be a video that could change everything. A cleaner called Jane is outside the silo, and her video footage shows birds flying outside. As a result of this, Allison drifts further away from Holston. She tells him that night that she's not okay, but she will be. Unfortunately, their year of potential baby-making comes and goes, but Allison doesn't show up at the clinic for their meeting about the baby. Allison is actually back home, and with the tap running, she confronts Holston about what she's found out. She was going to talk to him the night before but needed proof to confirm the enforcers were never going to let them have kids. Her birth control was never taken out, evidenced by a bloody knife and the actual implant on the table. Holston realizes his wife has cut herself open and he races off to get help for her. However, Allison isn't in their cabin anymore. She's in the cafeteria. She makes a big scene and tries to convince everyone that they need to listen. When they don't, she tells everyone inside the silo that she wants to go outside. This is a crime inside the silo, as evidenced earlier in the season, and she's taken away in handcuffs. Unfortunately, both George Wilkins and Gloria are both questioned too, as a result of Allison's ties with them. Holston believes that the stress of not having a baby has deterred her, and that's why she's acting this way. Well, Allison is completely lucid, and understands what's happening. She believes that the images inside the silo have been distorted and changed to stop them from going out. But why? Well... Allison is determined to find out. Allison is strapped up and ready to go outside. She's to clean the exterior of the silo and she's convinced that she's not going to die. This is hard for Holston to take though, who's convinced that she will. He does his job and reads out the oath, 
confirming that inside is safe and the outside is not. After, Allison tells him she loves him and prepares to take the walk outside. This happens to be directly opposite the cell too, and Holston eventually presses the button and lets the large door shut, keeping Allison out the silo. However, we don't see exactly what's there because there's a long climb to the surface. On the alleged window inside the cafeteria, Allison steps up and looks around. She makes it to the window and begins cleaning. With the view clearer than before, Allison walks away from the silo. Only in doing so, she collapses, crawling toward the remnants of a gnarled tree. She's dead. Or is she? We then jump forward two years later. Holston's whole world has fallen apart. George Wilkins has been transferred to Mechanical a year back, but he's shown up as dead, which is a bit suspicious. There's an engineer down there who's convinced that it's murder. The woman down there, Juliet Nichols, is someone whom Holston has been in contact with for a while, which we learn as narration cuts us back to the present timeline, where Holston is determined to find out the truth. Holston prepared to head outside. Once out the airlock, he's away from the law. He apologizes to them all for the fuss and prepares to brave the outside world. He makes the long climb up the stairs, ready for whatever may lay outside. Everyone joins together in the cafeteria to see Holston emerge from underground and into the wasteland beyond. Damn it, Allison, you were right, Holston says, as it seems like outside actually is this beautiful paradisiac area. He cleans the lens on the camera so those in the silo can see and heads toward the tree, which is beautiful and idyllic. But there's something wrong. He starts to choke and eventually collapses on the ground. Nobody has taken their helmet off before, so Holston is the first, and he begins crawling toward Allison's body, where he collapses and seems to die. Juliet is livid and takes off, shouting, He's a liar! She heads down to engineering and tries to keep herself in check. In her rage, she throws something and bursts one of the pipes, sending a stream of fresh water across the room. With the sheriff gone, the attention turns to who will pick up the mantle and take over. They're up to Sheriff Number 97, and with the sparks of rebellion rumbling in the streets, given the lack of law and order, things don't look good. In fact, an opportunist called Sims shows up and begins organizing traffic. It's been three months since George died during our timeline this episode, which cuts back in time. Juliet is convinced that he was murdered. He wanted to show Juliet something before he died, which includes a letter and a Pez dispenser which seems to hint at something. When George doesn't show up in her bunk, news of his death spreads. This catches us up to the moments from last episode, as Holston shows up to question Juliet about George's death. He seems to have fallen 100 feet and there's no witnesses here, given it occurred at 3 a.m. Suicide is apparently a crime here, but Juliet is convinced that he wouldn't have killed himself. She confides in Holston and tells him as much, even going on to mention that George has left something for her. She doesn't want him to rat her out regarding this relic, so Holston agrees to bend the truth a little and claim that he just found it rather than that he got it from her. Juliet shows that the letter reads, Remember where you last saw this? Which is a message only Juliet can decipher. It's to do with the Pez dispenser, and she leads Holston into a secret area, hidden behind a large sign and down a hidden tunnel. With a torch in hand, they continue until the bottom of the stairs, where they come to a large open area. There, Juliet shows off the remnants of a huge spidery digger robot. Apologies for the lack of a technical term here. Anyway, this thing is just a husk now, given all the precious materials that have been stripped and taken off it. However, it's enough to open Holston's eyes to a whole world that's been hidden in plain sight. The pair arrive at a makeshift camp down there, which happens to be the location George hinted at with the letter. These are all relics from the old world, including a camcorder that Juliet is struggling to turn on. He sold and traded relics in his spare time. Juliet notices something different this time a piece of string that tracks all the way across to a suspended piece of steel. Attached on the end happens to be a bag holding even more relics. There's instructions on recovering deleted files with Allison's handwriting on the back. There's also the computer drive too, but Holston reminds her that asking questions is dangerous. Part of Holston's interest here comes from Juliet's connection to George, and in particular, his ties with Allison. His wife was never afraid, and in a way, Holston sees some of his wife in Juliet. He tells her to stop wearing the watch as it draws attention, and he promises to keep looking into this in secret and figure out what the truth is. Back in the present, Deputy Marnes happens to have a letter from Holston, his final letter. He recommends Juliet Nichols to take over his role, along with taking on all his personal belongings too. Now, given Juliet was waiting for a sign, this could well be an indication as to what he meant, 
so she can take over his role. As for Juliet, her little outburst about calling Holston a liar is linked to him not giving her a sign and helping to find out what happened to George. Given George was driven to find out the truth, that role has now turned to Juliet to take over. And as the episode closes, Juliet drops a whole load of rope down that suspended steel beam and intends to rappel down, believing it could hold a clue to what's happening here. Juliet in the depths of the silo, dropping down her rope to the dark, dingy water below. Breathing heavily, she clings to her rope and eventually ascends again. Her search is fruitless. There's nothing down there. It does, however, spill out her emotions and she begins drinking, trying to wash away the bitter memories of George's death. In the morning, Juliet struggles to get up with her alarm ringing in her ear. Her door is wide open and a fellow engineer shows, asking her questions. Before they have to answer, a distinct rumbling snaps Juliet out of her half-drunk stupor. She races down to engineering where she immediately smacks a kid called Cooper in the face who's investigating the generator and takes charge of the situation. Juliet is pulled into a meeting with the head of engineering who tries to work out exactly what she's doing. After punching Cooper in the face, he tells her she's to take the day off and sober up. He reminds her she should be grateful that he's not sending her to the trash line or doing any other menial, unpleasant job after her outburst. The deputy meets the mayor and the pair head down to judicial together. Only they hesitate at the door. Mayor Ruth has a rather tenuous relationship with Judge Meadows, so Ruth heads deeper down the silo where he runs into Bernard. He's been crunching the numbers and warns that without a sheriff watching over everything, the likelihood of big riots and citizens arming themselves is increasing every second. Mayor Ruth steps up her investigation into Juliet's candidacy, this time turning toward Juliet's father, who happens to be one of the doctors down in the lower levels. He points out that Juliet has had massive interest in machines from an early age, but to be honest, he doesn't tell them much more. As Ruth herself says, more questions than answers. Ruth is unsure exactly why she's been recommended by Holston to take over his role, but the mayor tries to figure that out this episode. While sitting and eating together, the deputy and mayor are interrupted by Sims, who shows up with a fresh strawberry dessert. And it seems like he may be working under Judge Meadow. He pitches Ruth the name of Paul Billings, who is apparently the perfect guy for the sheriff role, but Ruth is not deterred and promises to make her choice when she's ready. Having sobered up, Juliet remains dedicated to fixing the generator and keeping the silo running. This also gets Ruth thinking as she visits Martha, the woman down in the workshop that's been there for 20 years. She wants to know exactly who Juliet is and whether she can be trusted. Martha puts in a good word for her colleague and it seems to convince Ruth, who similarly believes Juliet should take on the role. When she asks Juliet to take this on though, she outright declines, pointing out that the generator is not well and she needs to try and fix it. Despite her rejection, the mayor does hand over Holston's old sheriff badge, telling her Holston wanted her to have this regardless. There seems to be something carved on the back of the badge, but we don't see what this is until the end of the episode. As a result, Juliet changes her mind and agrees to take on the role. However, it comes with a catch. She needs to fix the generator first, and warns that they need to turn it off completely in order to do that. She's confident she can repair it, but it will mean there will be an eight-hour period of blackout. Mayor Ruth is worried that this could cause people to panic, but agrees all the same. Down in Mechanical, the engineers discuss what this really means given it could actually blow up should they keep the generator off for too long. The slightest mistake could leave everyone in the dark forever, or even kill someone. That's a convenient detail Juliet omitted from the mayor, but Ruth and the deputy turn their attention to the maintenance of the silo itself, agreeing to keep watch of the gun cabinet and make sure it's completely safe. The generator is turned off, and Juliet works with Cooper to try and find and fix the issue. Cooper is clumsy and drops one of the fan blades, which clutters onto the ground below. Juliet encourages him to focus, while the rest of the engineers down below work to straighten it out so they can put it back on again. Time is running out, though. They have very limited time to try and get this generator up and running again, and Juliet heads deep into the depths of the generator when they start to get warning lights, blasting it with cold water to try and cool the machine down. With a hose hitting the worst offended part, it works for the time being, but it's still touch and go for a while. They eventually get Juliet out. Everything is put back the way it was, and the generator is turned back on. Thanks to Juliet's bravery and the team working in tandem, they all manage to get the generator going, and it works an absolute treat. While everyone cheers, Juliet's victory is hollow, given she knows how close they came to annihilation. She's also saddened by the fact she's got to make good on her promise, too with her shipped off to become sheriff too. Juliet says her goodbyes to Martha, 
apologizing for her earlier outburst. Higher up in the silo, Bernard returns and knows that Juliet is going to be selected as sheriff and he's not happy with the mayor. He believes Juliet is not fit for office given she's proven to be a thief after taking some tape that didn't belong to her. He gives a thinly veiled threat. So what's on Holston's badge? Just before Juliet leaves engineering, she flips it over to reveal one word. Truth. We flip back to Mayor Ruth one more time, who looks under the weather. She walks away from the deputy, suddenly collapses on the floor and begins convulsing and bleeding from the mouth. Juliet called up to the mayor's office. This is, of course, about Ruth. She's dead. Deputy Marnes is shocked and he speaks to Bernard and Sims, believing that she's been spiked with rat poison. Ruth wasn't the target, though, as it seems like Marnes was the one intending to be killed. If Ruth hadn't drunk from his bottle, perhaps she'd still be alive, and the deputy is torn up over that fact. Bernard is actually sworn in to be the interim mayor for the time being, and that also means that he'll be swearing in Juliet as the sheriff, too. She's eventually shown over to the sheriff's office, but her assistant, Sandy, does not make life easy for her. There's prejudices against those in the bottom 50 levels. But Juliet gives as good as she gets. She wants access to files in the gun cabinet, but Sandy is loath to hand those details over until she's been sworn in officially. Juliet concedes and points out she only wants one file, that being George Wilkins. Juliet eventually throws her weight around and reminds Sandy that she's the one in charge and right now she wants Wilkins' file. That doesn't stop her from looking around herself, though, and her search brings her over to Holding 3, the infamous area that leads up to the surface. Interspersed around this are flashbacks showing more of Juliet's history with her PA. Her brother Jacob is not in a good state, and despite surviving an initial scare, it seems from a further sequence that he didn't make it, and neither did her mom either. Juliet heads down to recycling alone and drops off a lot of the gear from her apartment, although the friendly man there encourages her to keep hold of Jacob's favorite toy. Juliet has always had a fascination with fixing things, but while fixing up a chair, she tries to make some food and ends up causing the alarms to go off. She falls out with her PA when he returns, as Juliet blames him for what's happened. Not everything can be fixed, he says. Part of this includes sorting the recycling and working hard, long hours for the good of the silo. Juliet's forged letter inevitably brings her father down, but he decides that she can stay as long as she's happy. Back in the present, Bernard swears in Juliet as sheriff officially before she heads back to the office. Sandy returns not long after and tells her that there is no George Wilkins file. However, Holston did leave behind a file for whoever got the job. This happens to include a handwritten note and a cryptic clue. Before Juliet can look into this, though, Deputy Marnes ends up in a sticky situation down in the market as he begins smacking around a guy called Frankie, believing he's the one with the poison. A year back, Frankie poisoned two levels with rat poison. Deputy Marnes is frustrated that no one else is taking the Ruth murder seriously, and it's enough for Juliet to actually open up to him about what she's been doing. She points out exactly what she told Holston about George's murder and was told to wait for a sign. She believes it's the sheriff badge reading truth. In exchange for figuring out what happened to Ruth, Juliet wants Marnes to help find out who murdered George. The pair end up in a tenuous agreement. Juliet's history down in recycling allows her to actually have a better relationship with these people than Marnes would have, and perhaps even Holston too. Speaking of Marnes, he sets up a punching bag in his apartment to try and vent his anger. Down in Martha's lab, Martha manages to fix up the camcorder that Juliet was messing about with last episode. However, we don't see the outcome of that. Instead, we cut back to Juliet in her office as she decides to look at the rattling in the vents. This is something Bernard mentioned earlier, and it's perhaps a good thing she didn't agree to let someone take a look. When she does this herself, she notices something hanging there, which seems to be a vital clue. She brings the rattling chain out, which is linked to a bag full of papers. It's the George Wilkins file. As the episode closes out, we jump to Deputy Marnes one more time. It's after hours, and he's drunk. There's an indication that he might drop his bottle off the edge of the silo to the depths below, but he thinks twice about that. Instead, he heads back to his apartment. However, whilst there, he's suddenly attacked by someone who holds him up at gunpoint. 